So today we're going to start talking about chapter two, which has to do with representing motion. It has to do with velocity, uh, acceleration, vectors, scalars, all these kinds of things that will really give us kind of the ground level for the rest of the year. Okay, um, everything that we learn in chapter two uh, and most of our equations are ones that we'll use throughout the whole rest of the year. Okay, so if you're gonna you're gonna pay attention and learn any chapter, this should be the one. Okay, hopefully everyone, but this should be the one in particular. Okay. So we're going to talk about what it means to represent motion and what are the different types um, of methods we can use to represent motion. Okay? So when we look around us in the everyday world, motion is everywhere, right? Everywhere we look, things catch our eye, right? Because they are in motion. It's much more interesting for us to look at something in motion rather than something that is stationary. What does this mean for something to be stationary? Yeah, it's not moving. Okay. So we're always looking at things that are in motion. Anytime an object is in motion, we would have to think about it in terms of its position changing. Right? Its position is changing. Um, so when we talk about speed and velocity, which we're going to get into today, um, we have to think about it in terms of how fast is its position changing. Right? So if I start here at the front of the room and I walk to the back of the room, I'm in motion because my position has changed. Right? I've gone from one point to point, for, from point A to point B in a certain amount of time. That's my velocity or my speed. Okay? So whenever something's in motion, um, we see a position change happening. Okay. There's a couple different types of motion, um, first of which is the most simplistic and what we're going to cover first, which is straight line motion. That can be any object that moves from point A to point B in a very simple straight line. Right? That's what we're going to look at first. A car driving on the road, something that's falling. Right? When something falls straight down, um, it falls in straight line motion. Okay? Something in free fall is considered straight line motion. Um, objects in circular motion we'll get to um, later in the year. These are things that move in a circular path, not necessarily that are spinning yet, but things that move in a circular path. So what would be an example of things that move um, in a circular path, but don't necessarily spin? Yeah, don't necessarily have to spin. Okay, yeah. Planets that orbit, right, they move in a circular path. Okay, what about um, a car that drives around a curve? Right, that's a circular path, um, but it's not spinning, right? So those are different types of circular motion we'll cover later. Um, arc motion is a, is a specific type of motion that we see um, basically a portion of a circle. So what does an arc look like? Just kind of draw it with your hand. What does it look like, right? Something that goes up and comes back down, okay? That in physics terms is called a projectile, right? Something that moves both horizontally and vertically, through the air. That would be an arc type motion. So we go up and we come back down, but we're still moving horizontally the whole time. Um, and then back and forth motion is called simple harmonic motion. Uh, that would be like an example of a pendulum. Do you know what a pendulum is? Where do we see pendulums? Swinging balls. Okay, yeah. And a clock, right? Uh, a swing set. Right, a swing on a swing set is moving in a pendulum type um, motion. Okay, so that's what back and forth motion means. That's called simple harmonic motion. We have repetitive motion. Okay. So we're going to talk almost exclusively in this class about straight line motion. Motion is the big. Um, what am I trying to say? The big focus of this course. We're going to look at how things move and why things move. Right. That's what we're, our focus is on in this physics course. So. We're going to look at straight line motion. And in straight line motion, we always have to refer to the time that it's taking place and the location at that time. So we're looking at how far has it moved during this time or how long did it take to go from point A to point B. Okay, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so motion always relates to a place and time. How long did it take to get there, and how far did it travel? And those are the types of questions that we're going to be answering. Okay, so if we see in this picture 
Um, this is extremely simplistic straight line motion, right? This car moves from point A to point B, and it took him a certain amount of time, right? We're going to be able to solve those types of equations um, much more complex than ones like this, uh, but that's going to be where we start, right? We move from point A to point B. How many meters was it, and how long did it take us to do it? Okay, that's where we're starting at. And I'm sure you guys have solved questions like this before in math class in terms of rates. Have you heard the term rate before? Okay, a rate is how quickly you complete something. Okay, so we're looking at how quickly can we complete this distance, right? Or how can we move over this distance? Okay, so in this class, we're going to see a pretty um, variety or a, a large variety of what we consider motion diagrams. So any Thing that is used to describe motion or to visualize motion is considered a motion diagram. Okay, so the picture we just saw of the car moving from point A to point B would be considered a motion diagram. That's a pretty detailed picture, right? I don't take time to draw that type of picture for every problem that we do, um, but you'll see motion diagrams expressed in a lot of ways, okay? So a motion diagram in its definition, right? You don't have to have this definition down word for word, um, but it basically will show the interval of an object that's in motion. What's an interval? Yeah? Time intervals are small sections of time, right? So if we're looking at an object at an interval type setting, that means we're looking after one second, it's gone this far. After two seconds, it's gone this far. Three seconds, etc. Okay, so if you look at this picture of this person running, these are at equal time intervals, okay? Those dots at the bottom are showing that we're at equal time intervals. So is this person speeding up, slowing down, or going the same speed? Same speed. Same speed. So how can you tell? Right? How do we know he's moving at the same speed? That's right. The intervals are at equal distance. If he was speeding up, he'd be a little bit farther at that next time interval, and then a little bit farther at that next time interval. He wouldn't be right on top of it at every time interval. Okay, so motion diagrams can give us a good idea of what's going on in that motion. So here we don't see him speeding up or slowing down because his location is, is basically the same at each time interval. Right? He's covering the same amount of distance in each second. Okay, so that means he's moving at constant speed. We are going to represent our motion most of the time on a coordinate system or in a graph. Okay, and they're very, very simplistic graphs but they are in a technically a graph, right, a coordinate system. So every time we start looking at motion, we're going to get to choose where we put that coordinate system, and we get to choose where we put the origin more specifically. <coughs> okay, and this seems a little abstract for us right now, um, but I promise it will start making a little bit more sense when we see some, um, when we see some problems. Okay, so every time we have a, a problem and we want to draw a diagram, we're going to get to pick where that coordinate system goes, and we get to pick that origin. That at that time, or at that point, both its position and its time are zero, right? So we're starting right here. This is the beginning of our motion. So we always choose to put the origin at the start of our motion, okay? And let me show you kind of what I mean by this. And we're not going to get into um, the equation behind it, but this is what I'm talking about. So if I have a person... Um, that's standing on top of a building. Okay, so here's, and he's throwing a rock off the side of the building. Okay, so here's the rock. It's going to go up, and it's going to land at the bottom. Okay? <coughs> Instead of choosing my origin to be at the bottom, right, or at the ground level, I'm going to choose to put my origin right here where the motion starts from. Okay, because, right, that's how, I, that's how I indicate the origin, right? That's what a coordinate system looks like. In a coordinate system, the origin is at those crosshairs, right? The, the cross between the X and the Y axis. So I'm just drawing a little tiny version of that right here. Okay, that's telling me at that point, that's where the motion is starting. So my position is zero and time is zero at that point. After that, I'm looking at what happens to the motion, right? The thing goes up and then it comes back down. We're going to look at how many meters below it. It, it lands from where it started, how long it took it to get there, those types of things. Okay, but this is what I'm talking about. You get to pick the origin. You get to pick where you put that coordinate system. From there, we're going to be able to tell how many meters did it travel horizontally and how many meters did it travel vertically. Right, does that make sense? 
Okay. Um, if you always chose to put your origin at ground level, you could do that. Um, but I think it's simplistic for us in terms of uh, the number of variables that we're going to have. That's going to give us the ability to have two variables equal to zero. So that will make a little bit more sense when we get into our bigger equations. But yeah, you could choose to put the origin wherever you want, really. But I think putting at the start of the motion is the most simplistic for us. Okay. So in straight line motion... Um, the line that our motion is in, right, straight line motion, either moving purely horizontally or purely vertically, becomes the axis of the coordinate system. And we're looking at horizontal first. Okay, so this is what we're saying here. Okay, so this guy starts, right, this is, this could be me, right, I'm at the front of the room. This is my starting point, so this is where I would put the origin. I walk this way, this is straight line motion, I'm not going up, I'm not going down, I'm just going purely horizontal, okay? So I'm covering that point um, from point A to point B, I moved purely horizontally. And so on my coordinate system, right, I'm moving along the x-axis, that's it. Right, so straight line motion is extremely simple for us to diagram because we're not moving up, we're not moving down, right? Our graph wouldn't look like this, right? I'm not moving anywhere crazy. I'm going along the x-axis. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. We're going to indicate um, how far an object has moved by drawing an arrow. Okay, so arrows are going to be our method of, of drawing. And the arrow itself has a little bit more meaning than just an arrow, um, and I'll describe what that means here in a second, but we're going to use arrows to be able to describe our motion. Okay, so there's two, two ways that we can use to describe how far something has moved. What's a term that is really common for us describing how far something has moved? Distance. Good. Distance is the most simplistic way to describe how, some, how far something has moved. And there's a, there's a little bit of a difference here. So distance is how far total something has moved. The total length covered. That's important. Okay, so distance is the total amount of ground that you covered. But the definition that we're going to use more often is one called displacement. Have you heard the term displacement before? Yeah, yeah maybe. Okay, so displacement is how far you ended up from where you started. And that's a really important distinction between those two things. Displacement is the one we're going to use more often. So if you want to star that one so you can start to remember that word, and that's going to be the one that we use more often. But displacement is how far you ended up from where you started. Okay, so as I walked around the room, this was my starting point. I made one lap around the room. <coughs> What's my displacement? Zero. Zero. Okay. I covered a lot of distance, but my displacement was zero because I ended up exactly where I started. And that concept is tricky, okay? So just think about the difference between distance and displacement. I walked a lot of meters, but my displacement was zero, okay, because I'm ending up exactly where I started. Okay, so displacement is going to be the, the, the straight line from where I started to where I ended up, okay? The sh like the shortest route I can take. It's going to give me my displacement. Like, yeah. If you Equations for distance and displacement is just a lowercase d. Okay, distance or displacement. So we're going to use the um, equation delta displacement. What's the delta mean or the triangle here? Delta means change in, right? I've said this, I think, a thousand times. So delta means final minus initial. Your book uses these variables, <coughs> d sub f. 
for displacement final and d sub i for displacement initial. Right? Realistically, what should your initial displacement always be? Zero, right? That's what we talked about. We get to pick the origin. So this is one of those variables that's almost always going to be zero. Right? That's, since we get to pick our origin and put it where our motion is starting from, this, that initial displacement is almost always going to be zero. Okay? So that really takes away the delta part at all. Right? We're not really doing a change in because it'd be something minus zero. Okay? Displacement is what we call a vector quantity. Okay? And a vector quantity is any type of measurement that has to have both magnitude and direction. So any type of measurement that has to have both magnitude and direction. Magnitude is the number, the size that goes into it. Okay, so there are lots of different types of vector. Velocity, acceleration, force, all those are types of vectors. They're measurements that have to have both size and direction. Okay? So displacement is the first of those vector quantities that we're going to learn. It has to have magnitude and direction. Okay? We represent a vector or displacement by an arrow. We talked about that a little bit ago. Okay? And it has to be drawn to scale. So what does that mean, drawn to scale? Do you know what that means? Um. Okay, so drawn to scale means we need to try to approximate the length in comparison to other vectors. So if I have um, two vectors, one is 10 meters and one is 5 meters, right, are those drawn to scale? No, right? So what should the 5 meter vector be? Half as long, right? So when I draw them to scale, we don't have to necessarily get out a ruler every time and measure them to actual scale. Right? We're going to learn how to do that. But when we're talking about drawn to scale, we're going to do our best to approximate them in terms of the ratios of those vectors. Okay? So if we have one that's twice as long, we need to draw it twice as long, is what we're saying. Okay, so we just talked about vectors. You don't have to write down this again. We just talked about um, the definition of that. Vectors have to have magnitude and direction. Now, scalar is another type of measurement that only has, oh, sorry, uh, okay, sorry, I'll finish talking about vectors, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, this would be an example of a vector. I ran forward four meters. So what's my magnitude there? If it has to have magnitude and direction, what's the magnitude of that measurement? Four meters, right? It has to have units too. What's the direction? Forward. Right? Direction can be given um, with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west. Can be given with a positive, negative. Can be given with forward, backward, up, down. Right? There's lots of ways that you can represent direction. Okay, so if I look on my coordinate system here, let's draw out our directions a little bit more so we're on the same page. This direction on a coordinate system would be north. This direction is East. Hopefully we have a few more people that know these directions. Okay, this is south and west. Okay, which two directions would be considered our positive directions? North and east. Good, so that means west and south would be considered our negative directions. So you can indicate um, direction or indicate our vector with a negative as well. So if we know we're moving horizontally and we say we went negative 10 meters, right? If we know it's horizontal, we know we went what direction? West or left, right? So left would be a negative if we said left and right. Right, right would be a positive, left would be a negative. Okay, so we're always putting it on this coordinate system um, to envision this. And okay, when we talk about direction. How many have to have magnitude and direction? Scalars. Scalars are another type of measurement that only have to have magnitude. So they only have to have the size. Right? They don't include direction. Scalars are used much less often. Okay? We are going to really focus on vectors and their, um, and their measurements. Scalars are used much, left off, much less often, but they have to have only a magnitude. Okay? So that means things like distance. Okay, distance is a scalar quantity, displacement is a vector quantity. 
Okay, so there's again the difference between those two things. Why is it that distance couldn't have a direction that goes with it? Right, so let's think about when I walked around the room again. Right, I walked around the room, I covered... Yeah, you go in multiple directions during that distance I covered, right? I went here, went north and east, then south and west, right? So I went all four directions... So in my final distance, I couldn't have had a direction that goes with it because I went all four of them. Right? But my displacement, I could tell exactly I, how far I ended up from where I started. Okay? So distance, time, and temperature are ones that do not have any mm, direction that goes with it. Okay? So let's start talking about diagramming these motions. Okay? Start at our origin, which is here, right? So if you want to draw a little mini coordinate system, you can. If you just want to follow along, you can too. I don't really care, okay? Forward two meters. We're talking about horizontal motion first. So which way am I moving? To the right. We're going to assume every block is a meter. So one, two. We draw it with an arrow, okay? And the arrow always goes in the direction of the motion. I shouldn't have to say that, but yet sometimes I do, right? If we're going to the right, that's the direction the arrow should be going. So forward two meters. After that, we go backward six meters. So do I start back at the origin? No, I'm going to start from where I ended. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So how much total distance have I covered so far? How much distance? Eight meters. But what's my displacement at this point? Negative four. Right, negative four meters because I'm behind where I started. So now I go forward four meters, one, two, three, four. I'm back at the origin, so my displacement as of right now is zero. My distance as of right now is 12. Good. Last, I go forward five meters, one, two, three, four, five. All right, so here is my final displacement, okay? So my final displacement is five meters forward. Okay, see how I added those um, vectors right on top of the other? Those arrows are vectors. Um, I added them right on top of each other because we're not starting at the origin each time. We're turning around from where we ended. Okay? So that's what we just did. We, we, we used a method called graphical addition. Right? We added these vectors graphically on that diagram. So it sounds a lot more intense than it really was. Right? All we did was show what our motion was doing. That's called adding vectors graphically. Okay, it should be drawn to scale, which they were, because we were already on a coordinate system. Okay, so that made it easy. To the actual magnitude. Okay, so we drew them to scale of our magnitude. That was what we wanted. We used what is called the tail-to-tip method. Okay, so on an arrow, what end do you think is the tip? The left or the right? Right. Okay, right here is the tip, and this end is the tail, right? You never knew an arrow was so um, detailed. Okay, we used a tail-to-tip method. So that means when we went from our first vector to our second, we added the tail of the second onto the tip of the first. All right, so as we draw all these vectors, we put the tail of the next one on the tip of the last one. Okay, does that make sense? So if I was trying to draw, find my final displacement here, I'd go from my origin to my last vector. That would be my displacement. Okay, and we're going to look at how we solve that. Uh, but for right now, that's, that's what we're looking at, right? We're going to add all these vectors tail to tip, and then to find my displacement, I'd go from my origin to the tip of my last vector. Okay, you feeling okay so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the sum of all vectors is called the resultant vector. From the origin to the tip of the last vector. So that means when you draw your first vector, you need to draw the origin, right? Draw the little crosshairs to indicate where the origin is. Otherwise, you'll go through all your vectors and you'll forget... Where did I start, right? There should be an empty tail, but that's where you should draw that origin out, okay? So 
So if we go back to our, no, I don't want to do this one again. Sorry. Let's try this one with, to find a resultant vector. Okay, I don't want to go back to that writer example because that was too easy. Let's go try this resultant vector example. Okay, in this one we already have our coordinate system drawn, right? And here's our origin. Make it a different color. First we go 11 kilometers north, then 11 kilometers east. So let's say each of these are 2 kilometers. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Okay, I'm going to have to go up a little bit. And then we go 11 kilometers east. So am I going to go start from the origin? No. No, where do I start from? Yeah, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Okay. Probably should have gone by threes there, but you know. Okay, so that means to find my resultant, that's the sum of my vectors. The resultant vectors here is going to tell us our displacement. So where should our resultant vector go from? Origin to the tip of the last vector. So here. So now if we know that our vectors are both 11 each, how do we go about solving for our displacement? Yeah, Pythagorean theorem. It's back. It's back, okay? So we need to find how far we ended up from where we started, right? We're at this point. We want to find how far we ended up from where we started. So go get your calculator out. Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So which of those are we solving for here, a, b, or c? C, because it's our hypotenuse. Okay. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay. 15.6 kilometers, right? We need to match our units. So is that a good enough, um, is that a good enough measurement for us to tell us we ended up 15.6 kilometers away from where we started? I have to have direction. So what's my direction here? Northeast. Is that specific enough? Yes, no. But if I have to ask the question, it's probably no. Okay, so if I said northeast, that means I could have left northeast here, or northeast here, or northeast here, right? I could have walked any direction northeast 15.6 kilometers, and I wouldn't have ended up at this point. So the way I get to that exact location is I have to find the angle. Okay, I have to find the angle at which to leave my origin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that means you need to use your trig functions. Sine, cosine, tangent. What'd you say? One of them is 90, exactly. We're always going to deal with right triangles. Always going to deal with right triangles. I won't give you any crazy triangles. Well, if there's two equal sides, then they equal, let's say, they have to know the same. They have equal, if they're equal sides. Okay. Right? I don't know. Yeah, it has to be this way. 45, 45, 90. Sure. I don't know. Okay, great. I, okay, if we didn't know that it was a 45, 45, 90 triangle, how do you solve for this angle? Sine 90. What are you guys talking about? Second tangent. Second tangent. Okay, look, this is, this is, I'll show you how I would go about solving for this. We solved, we calculated 15.6. So what if we calculated that wrong? Would we want to use it to find our angle? No. Listen, listen, listen. We calculated 15.6. If we calculated it wrong, then we calculate our angle wrong too. So this is how I would go about it. I'd say second tangent, right, because I'm trying to find the angle of opposite over adjacent. Right? You need to make sure your calculator is in degrees, not radians. Second tangent of 11 over 11. Okay, which you guys already told me was 45 degrees, which is great. Okay, so for triangles that aren't equal sides, we need to know how to solve sine, cosine, tangent triangles. Right? Okay, and we'll get there. We're still going to do more math review. Um, I'm not throwing you that. This isn't your main lesson today. We're just introducing what vectors are and graphic addition of vectors are. But um, you need to know how to do that. Okay, so we're at 45 degrees. 
Can we just say northeast? No. 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 Okay. We have to say, is it east of north or north of east? East of north. Okay. For 45 degrees, it really doesn't matter. Okay. But if it was anything else, it's also north of east. That's right, because it's 45 degrees. For if it's anything else besides 45 degrees, we have to tell what angle it is, right, and what direction it's coming from. So let's f figure out how we, how did we determine it was north of, east of north, sorry. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, what, ang what um, axis is that angle touching? The north, the east, the south, or the west? What axis is that angle touching? This one. Touching the north axis. Look, north, east, southwest. It's touching the north axis. Just hang in there with me, please. Here's the north axis. That angle is touching the north axis. From there, we decide, does our triangle go east of north or west of north? Okay, it goes east of north. Okay, again, this isn't our main, main topic for today, but I want to introduce you to what that's going to look like. So don't let it freak you out if you don't quite get it yet. We'll get there, okay? But we need to know how to add them tail to tip and solve for that resultant vector, Okay. Okay, here's our, our really our main one for today. And so if you want to come get an, an equation sheet up here from the front, we're going to start um, getting our main equations today. So here's our, here's our equation. Velocity equals change in displacement divided by change in time. Change in displacement over change in time. That's what velocity equals. Okay, this, listen carefully, this little line over the V stands for average. Okay, and your book labels it that way, I will not label it that way again. Okay, so you do not need to include that line over that velocity. Don't let that freak you out. I just put it there in case um, you follow along with your textbook because it puts over that um, average. We'll always solve for average velocity, so we're always going to use that. Okay? So it doesn't mean No, it just means average, and we're always going to solve for average velocity, so there's no need for us to put it there every time. Okay? Change in displacement over change in time. So let's think about the change in time, right? Are we going to ever really get an initial time? No. Right? What are, how are problems usually worded, right? It took us 12 seconds or 5 seconds, right? That is the change in time. So it's rare that you're going to have a final time and an initial time, right? You're going to have the change already. So just make sure you understand that part. If we were going to predict the units for velocity, what would it be? Meters. Second. Second. Good, right? Displacement is measured in meters. Time is measured in seconds. So our, our units are meters per second. Okay? Velocity is a vector quantity, which means it has to have magnitude and direction. Okay, so you've learned about two vectors today. What are they? Velocity and no, not dis not direction, but or not not distance, but displacement. Displacement and, and velocity are two vectors that we learned about today. Okay, what does it mean if we have a negative velocity? So if I say we move, we went negative ten meters per second. What is that telling us? Yeah, good. We're going backwards. Okay, or we're going in the downward direction, depending on if we're looking at horizontal or vertical motion. Very good. So the negative indicates to us direction. That's important, and that's tough to visualize with velocity, but it indicates to us a direction. Okay, we're moving backwards or in the negative direction as indicated by your coordinate system. We'll always use a very standard coordinate system. So to the left is backwards and down is backwards. Or negative, I mean. Our units are meters per second, which we already talked about. A car travels with a velocity of 50 meters per second east for two minutes. They then turn south and travel 30 meters per second for two minutes. What was the total distance covered? Total distance covered, not total displacement, total distance. Okay, so this is a two-part problem, right? Go ahead and write down what you need to, and then we'll get started here in just a minute. I'll give you a minute or so to write down what you need to. 
Okay, so we're trying to find out how many meters did they travel during that whole time, right? We're not necessarily trying to find their displacement. We're trying to find out how many meters, what was the total distance they traveled. So the way we do that is we need to find out how many meters did they travel during this portion of their trip and how many meters did they travel during this portion of their trip. Okay, we have to do those two things separately because they're traveling in different directions. Okay, so the way we go about doing that is for our first section, the first portion of our trip, what was our velocity? 50 meters per second. Right, do we know our distance or displacement? No, that's what we're solving for. All right, so I'm just going to leave that as a, um, a D for displacement. And the time was two minutes. Can I leave it in minutes? No. no. I have to convert it to seconds. Okay, so two minutes is 120 seconds. I was going by hours. It's a good try. Yes, two minutes. No, we need to stop. Stop. No, seconds going like... <laughs> There's 3,600 okay. okay, so we always want our units here to match. Okay, so if this is meters per second, this needs to be second, and this needs to be meters, right? We need to make sure that our units match. That's really important. So if I'm solving for this top variable here, how do I go about solving for that mathematically? Multiply those two together. Okay, when I'm solving for the top one, right, I'm going to move 120 over by multiplying, and whatever I do on the right, I have to do on the left. So 50 meters per second times 120 seconds is 6,000 meters east. Okay, so I do the same thing for the second portion of my trip. Velocity was 30. I'm solving for distance over 120 seconds. Okay, since we're not trying to find total displacement, do we have to do Pythagorean theorem? No, if we wanted to find the displacement, that'd be how far we ended up from where we started, right? But that's not what we're solving for. We want to find the distance. So if we traveled 6,000 meters here and 3,600 meters here, what's my total distance traveled? 9,600 meters. And does it have a direction that goes with it? No. Distance does not. Distance has no direction, right? Because we went two different directions in that time. Okay, do we see how we broke down that velocity equation? Velocity equals distance over time? Okay. We solve for distance. If we wanted to find the displacement, how would we go about doing that? Right? So we can just draw that same diagram. We know how many meters we traveled in each direction. My displacement is my resultant vector, right? Which always goes from the... My resultant vector always goes from where? Good. Okay, so let's solve that Pythagorean theorem. And we need to find the angle that goes with it. Okay, I got about 6,997.1 meters, okay, by finding the hypotenuse there. Would we agree with that? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Do we agree or no? Give me like a head nod at least if you agree that far. Okay. Second part here is to find the angle to tell us where we need to leave our, our origin, going in what direction. Okay, so if I want to find this angle, what should I use? Um, tangent, second tangent. Right, I'm probably going to use tangent because I know those are correct, right? I don't necessarily know that my hypotenuse is correct. Okay, hopefully I solved it right, but 
Technically, we solved these two also, but, you know, whatever. We're going to go with it. You could use any of them. That's right. You could use any of them. Okay, because you know all three sides of the triangle. So you could use any. That's right. Uh, I would use tangent, right? And I have to use second tangent whenever I solve for the angle of opposite over adjacent. Okay, so anytime we have to solve for the angle, we want to use the second button. Make sure your calculator is in degrees, not radians. So if you're not getting the number that I'm getting, uh, that's probably why. Okay, 30.96 or 31 degrees, right? We can round that up. So think in your head here, uh, what, what direction is going to go with that? 30 point, just think in your head. Think in your head. Which direction is going to go with that? Um, blank of blank. So at 31 degrees, direction of direction. So is it north of east? Is it west of north? Is it south of east? East of south? What do you think? South of east. South of east. East, that's right. South of east. Okay, so the reason that it's south of east is that angle is touching the east axis. Then we decide, does it go north of east or south of east, right? Does our triangle face north of east or south of east? So it goes south of east. Okay, this side of our triangle over here would be east of south. Okay, if we did that angle right there, it would be east of south. Okay. All right, why don't you try this one on your own? You need to get to Lawrence in 32 minutes. What will your velocity be in meters per second? Try this one on your own. What jumps out at you here? Your units. That's right. You need to change your units. Per second. Okay, so we're converting... Kilometers to meters, 40,000 meters over 1920 seconds, I think. It's 20.83 meters per second. And what, is my, what does my uh, answer have to have? Units, Units and direction. How many of you forgot to put east on there? Okay, mm. the good thing is that luckily east is a positive direction. So by having your number positive, that's telling me that it's going east, but it's a good idea to do both. So You'd have to have a negative or a west, yes, but not both. What would our velocity be if it was kilometers per hour? Okay, so solve that same problem except in kilometers per hour. You can do a conversion from your meters per second answer to kilometers per hour, or you can just do the, the velocity again in kilometers per hour. No, it should be bigger. So, velocity, listen, velocity is a, velocity is a vector quantity. So, velocity, vector, both start with what? V. Okay. Velocity and vector both start with V. Speed, however, on the other hand, is a Scalar quantity, speed, scalar. So that means, what does it not have? Speed has no direction. Good. So it's a scalar quantity of velocity. It has no direction. It's just distance divided by time. It's not displacement. It's distance divided by time.
Okay, remember that distance is different than displacement. So in our speed calculations, we're going to use the total distance covered, not just how far we ended up from where we started. All right, we're using the total distance. Uh, speed has no direction because it's a scalar quantity. No direction. Still has to have units, which would still be meters per second, but it has to have no direction. Okay? Absolute value of velocity. Speed cannot be negative. Okay? Because negative indicates to us a direction. So speed is always a positive quantity, unlike velocity. Right? The negative on a velocity or a displacement indicates to us direction. Okay, so that means speed or distance can never be negative. Okay. Right, this problem looks similar to us, but we're going to find speed instead of velocity. Okay, doesn't this look similar? Okay. So we already solved for the distance that was traveled. Now how do we go about solving for the total average speed? Yeah, we add the distances and then we do what? Divided by time. So we, we solved this problem earlier. 50 meters per second for two minutes was a total of 6,000 meters, right? Wow. The next part was 30 meters per second for two minutes, which was a total of 3,600 meters. Okay, so that gives us a distance traveled of 9,600 meters divided by the total time it took to travel that distance. Okay, which was how many total minutes? Which is how many total seconds? Okay, thanks. <laughs> After I wrote it down, all of you were like, 240. Okay, uh, somebody do the math for me. I do appreciate you answering them. Yeah. <laughs> 40 meters per second. Okay, so when we think about average speed, we have to think about the total distance divided by the total time. So if they had stopped for 30 seconds in between that turn, we have to add that 30 seconds into our total time, okay? Because it slows down the total speed of our trip. Okay, that's just something to think about. All right, um, a high school athlete runs 100 meter dash in 12.2 seconds. What's her velocity in meters per second? Find her velocity in meters per second. This should be easy. Easy, easy, easy. Eight point two? Agreed? Eight point one nine six, right? I'll round that up to eight point two. 